Well, good morning, First Assembly. It's Pastor Rebecca. Thanks for joining us for First at Home. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. I'm going to go grab my cup of coffee. I'm going to get ready to worship with you and to listen to God's Word. We hope you enjoy. and girls and welcome back to this week's episode of First Kids Online. I'm Pastor Rebecca and I'm so happy that you have joined us this morning. So here's what you'll need today. You'll need your Bible. So make sure you have your Bible handy just like mine. And if you are working with us at home and you have made your Life of Abraham map, make sure to have this handy as well because we'll be looking at this today in just a few moments. So are you ready for the question of the day? It's a pretty simple one. The question is easy. It says, uh, do you think it's okay to lie? So take a minute, uh, pause this video and talk about it with your family and then come right back to me and then we'll talk about it some more. So while you're doing that, I'm going to take a little nap. Wake me up when you're back. Oh, you're back. Okay, good. I'm glad that you woke me up. I would have slept the whole way through kids' church. Okay, I hope you said the answer was no, that it is never okay to lie. In fact, one of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses was do not lie. So I think it's pretty important. Have you ever lied before? And has any good ever come of it? Well, I've lied before, and I'm going to tell you that nothing good came after it. In fact, it made me feel horrible in the inside, and it hurt a lot of other people, too. And so that's basically what happens to Abram in our story today. He tells a lie, and we're going to see how God responds to him after he's made a bad choice. So if you have been following along with your life of Abraham, I want you to get your map out. And here is my... Um, Abraham and Sarah, little picture here. And we left off last week with Abraham and Sarah um, leaving their home in Haran to a place that God had called them. He called them to leave everything and move to a place that they had never been to before. It was the land of Hebron or Canaan, and they moved there over 400 miles away. They made the journey together. Now, last week, we, we learned that Abraham is a lot like you and me. Sometimes he's really strong in his faith and he believes everything that God says. And other times he gets weak and weary. And today we're going to find out in our story that this is one of those times that Abraham, well, he was still Abram then, um, had a really hard time believing God and he got himself into some trouble. And we're going to see if we can see ourselves in Abraham today. So that's why I asked you if you had ever, if you ever thought that lying was okay or you've ever told a lie. Um, so I'm going to read in our story today that see what happens next. After Abraham and Sarah are settled in Canaan, something happens and, and we're going to read about it. So I want you to get your Bibles out and turn with me to Genesis chapter 12 and put your finger on verse 10. And I'm going to read, and I want you to follow along, and I want you to listen for the, for the time that you see Abraham do something that probably isn't the best choice, and then we'll talk about it, okay? All right, here is, put your listening ears on, I'm going to read at verse 10. It says, at that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt, where he lived as a foreigner. And as he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarai, Look, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Let's kill him, and then we can have her. So please, tell them you are my sister, and then they will spare my life and treat you well because of you. They will treat me well because of you. And sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone spoke of Sarai's beauty. When the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king, and Sarai was taken into his palace. Then Pharaoh gave uh, Abram many gifts because of her. He was given sheep, goats, cattle, male and female donkeys, and male and female servants and camels. But the Lord sent a terrible plague upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarai, and so Pharaoh summoned Abram and accused him sharply. What have you done to me? He demanded. 
Why did you tell me she was your, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did she say, why did you say that she is your sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now, here is your wife. Take her and get out of here. Pharaoh ordered that his men escort them away and he sent Abram out of his country along with his wife and all their possessions. Okay, I hope that you saw that Abram told a lie here. All right, let's go back and let's just talk about it. So, boys and girls, it is never a good idea to lie, and we're going to find out why today. So here's what's happening in our story of Abraham. He moves to a place where God has called him to the land of Canaan, but something happens when they get there. They find themselves in a famine, and a famine means that there is no rain that comes and waters the plants to grow, and so there is no water and there is no food for the people to eat. And so because there was no food in Canaan, they decided that they were going to move to Egypt for just a little while um, so um, that they could eat and they could have food. Now, so they traveled again right down here to the land of Egypt. Now, while they're on their journey, something happens. Something happens to Abraham and he gets really nervous and he starts to kind of become afraid that when they get to Egypt, people will see his wife, think that she's beautiful, and then want to take her for their own wife and then kill Abram. So he gets fearful for his life. And so he decides that he's going to tell a lie. So he says to his wife, sorry, hey, listen, here's what we're going to do. You're going to pretend that we are brother and sister instead of husband and wife. That way they won't kill me. They'll be kind to us both and everything will be okay. So that's exactly what happened. When they come to the land of Egypt, they definitely notice that his wife Sarai is very, very beautiful. And because Abram tells them that this is his sister, they think she's a single lady and that she is available to marry. And so immediately Pharaoh takes her into his palace to become his wife. Oh no, can, can that happen? Can you be married two times? No, you can't. Sarai was already married to Abram, and now Abram, what is he going to do now? He is in this hot mess. Now he has his wife who has been taken into the palace to be married to another man. Well, in the meantime, uh, Pharaoh is really nice to Abram, and he begins to give him all the things that he needs to live. He gives him servants and food and animals. But all of those things don't make Abram feel good. In fact, it makes him feel really terrible. What is he going to do? Now he's just lost his wife. We're going to see exactly what God does in, to them in this situation. But that makes me think, what have we done in the past? When have we maybe not trusted God so much and we have taken matters into our own hands that we have either become really fearful, maybe we're really afraid that something is going to happen, and so... Uh, we don't go to God right away and ask for help. Instead, we make up something, right? We, we tell a lie. Um, and that then affects us. It doesn't make us feel good to lie. And it hurts a lot of other people. So we see here that it definitely hurts a lot of people. And so here's how God responds. God makes Pharaoh and everybody in his palace really sick. Like, I don't know if it was the stomach flu, but it was bad. And they all got sick. And, a and uh, Pharaoh has a hunch that this has everything to do with Abram and his wife Sarai. Sarai. So he calls Abram back to the palace and he says, What have you brought on us? Ever since I took your, your sister to be my wife, everything has just been terrible here. He says, Why did you lie to me? Why didn't you just tell me that this was your wife, not your sister? He was livid. He was so mad that he had been, all of these sicknesses had been brought on to his people. And so he says, here's your wife. I don't want her. Take her and get out of my country. And so Abraham and Sarah, they leave Egypt. Now, I feel like, phew, that was close. He almost lost his wife. But God was so generous with Abraham and Sarah, and he saved the day. God comes in and saves the day so that Abraham does not lose his wife. Now there's some lessons that we can learn here from Abraham's mistakes, can't we? 
We have all been in situations before where we haven't fully trusted God. And unfortunately, when we doubt what God says to us, we make bad decisions. And that's exactly what happened to Abraham and Sarah. They made a bad decision and they didn't trust God fully. Now, they had just trusted God uh, not very long before that. They had come into the land that God had for them. And now they're in the land and now they start to doubt God. Now there's not any food in the land and they begin to get weary. Like maybe God didn't really mean what he said he was going to do. Maybe, maybe we need to take things into our own hands. But every time, boys and girls, that we doubt what God says about us and we doubt what he says to us, we get, can get into a situations where we make bad decisions. And that's where Abraham is in our story today. But I want you to learn something today. I want you to learn that just because you have messed up doesn't mean God doesn't love you. And, and it doesn't mean that God's promises aren't for you anymore. He still wants to have a relationship with you. He still wants to love you. But we definitely need to come back to God and we need to ask for forgiveness. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? That means that just because we mess up and make bad decisions doesn't mean that God won't forgive us. In fact, he wants to forgive us. He wants you to come to him and say, God, I'm so sorry that I made this foolish mistake. Will you forgive me? And you know what, boys and girls, the answer will always be yes. God loves you so much, and he wants us to have a relationship with him. And he knows that sin separates us from God. So that's why we don't want to lie. That's why we want to keep our, our relationship close with Jesus so that we can, he can help us make good decisions. So let's take a minute right now and let's pray that if you have done something today or you have done something in your past that wasn't the right decision and God is uh, letting you see that right now, that what you've done in the past maybe hasn't been a good decision, maybe you've lied, maybe you've taken things into your own hands because you were scared and you didn't trust God all the way and, you, and it led you to make a bad choice. Well, let's pray right now that God would forgive us. I'm going to say the prayer for me. You say the prayer for you at home. And then we, God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness because he is so faithful and he loves us so much. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I just come to you right now and I thank you for your forgiveness and for your love. And I ask right now that you would forgive me for all the things that I have done that weren't right choices, God. The things that I have done um, that were sinning against you. I pray, God, that you would forgive me and that you would cleanse me and make my heart new again like your word says that you will do. I believe you, God, for this promise is true because you always do what you say you're going to do. In your name I pray, amen. So boys and girls, if you've ever messed up, it's not too late to ask God for, to forgive you. And we're going to learn more lessons from Abraham next week. So don't miss. See you later and have a good day. Bye. in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry, everything to God in prayer. temptations is there trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer and we find a friend so Take it to 
the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in Despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a solace there. Blessed Savior, thou hast our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to Thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory, bright, unclouded, there will be no need for endless worship will be our sweet portion
For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. 2 Timothy 1, 7. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Matthew 6, 34. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow. at home. My name is Terrence Hall. I'm the lead pastor at First Assembly. 
in Walla Walla, Washington. I wanted to start today by bringing attention to one of the missionary team that serves our church or that we partner with overseas. And each month we send offerings to help missionaries in various parts of the world. And, and uh, they're church planters or trainers, helpers and kids and children's uh, ministry some working with trafficking or whatever the case may be. And we partner with strategic partners around the world in missions. When you give an offering to missions at First Assembly, everything that goes to missions in our church that's sent in for missions goes to missions. We never take anything out. And so if you'd like to help us in our mission outreach, please do so on, on our uh, giving platform. You can make that designation for your giving. And, we do believe in missions, but what I bring all that up for today is when I begin, I want to pray for our missionaries overseas. And there are two primary focuses that um, I really think we need to pray for today. One is our missionaries, and, and the second is our, our government as we walk into a new season in America's leadership. Uh, but first, let me just say for the missionaries, there are a couple ways that you can pray for your missionary. One is that their passion is renewed. I know when you're serving in the mission field, and I've been there in this regard, every Sunday where I traveled someplace, generally speaking, I was the preacher. I give out and give out and give out, and rarely did I ever sit and just receive, simply because as a missionary it's what I did. And so sometimes you find yourselves tiring, just that passion, that energy is tiring. And and so I want to pray that God would restore a passion and just refresh missionaries wherever they are. I want to pray that God would give them open doors, divine open doors. and They, they need that, those connections that they would have to have just to uh, do their ministry and to do it well. So I want to pray for those things specifically for our missionaries. And I also want to pray for our new leadership in America. This week for us uh, is the inauguration of our new president, Joe Biden, and from the position of president all the way down to local communities all around America. There are new council members and mayors and leaders of all sorts. I want to pray that God would give them wisdom and help them in their roles. I want to pray that they make good ethical decisions and work for the welfare of the people they represent and that God would bless them and help them in all the things that they endeavor to do. I know the responsibility, I assume the responsibility would be incredible and you'd have to have a lot of people around you to carry out the task and, and they do. But uh, I want to pray that God would just help them. I also realize this and I want you to realize it too, that God is in control of everything in our lives and in our communities, in our nation and in the world. He's sovereign. And nations rise, nations fall. God puts in leadership those he wants for his purpose. And so we just do what the Bible says and that is to pray for those in authority over us. So before I begin our teaching today in Ephesians, let me just pray for these two things specifically and then I want to pray God's blessing on the word. Lord, I pray today for missionaries, those that we support here at First Assembly in Walla Walla, our strategic partners that are around the world, as well as missionaries that are represented by others that are listening to me today. I pray, God, that you would help them renew their energy, renew their, their passion, keep them fresh, I pray, as they give out, give back to them their daily devotion and encouragements. I pray you open up doors divine connections that they would have that would enable them to do their work. I pray you just give them strong voices. Lord, I pray also for our nation today, for our newly elected president and, and every position from there down to our local communities where we have new uh, people that sit in our community offices, our mayors, and I pray, Lord, then in each of these positions of leadership, that you would help them, even beyond sometimes their understanding. May they make moral and ethical decisions. And Father, I pray that you would bless them. 
Father, I pray for this nation. I pray that there would be revival that would come across the nation for people to come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, may that revival even begin with me. As I pray for those in authority, as I encourage people, as I share the message of Christ, that I lift up Jesus, and then all men will be drawn to you. Lord, I pray your blessing on the word today. As we look at Ephesians once again, help our eyes to be enlightened. Help that revelation of knowledge in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. I do not cease giving thanks for you, for I'm making mention of you in my prayers. For I'm making mention of you in my prayers. Now, even before I move on, let me just point out two parts to this verse. One is, in this verse, I see the value Paul places on prayer. Do not quit giving thanks. I do not cease giving thanks. Prayer was important to Paul. It shows here his value that he places on prayer. Prayer should be something that is daily, ongoing, part of a believer's life. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ending. To live, actually, in a presence of prayer. Always ready to call on God, who is always listening for us. Paul, in his letters, prays often. In fact, you could say it's almost one of his calling cards in his letter, how he prayed for other people. He valued this prayer and this, this time of praise. He prayed for those around him, prayed for them, and he was thankful for those around him. In all of his writing, he's, he's, he's praying and he's thankful for them, even in prison. Paul prays and expresses thanks for those he writes. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 3 through 5, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my, my every prayer for all of you, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul is praying for and thankful for those sitting beside him. He has this value of prayer that he expresses for those around him. Here's my question for you. It's actually a pause to the pastor moment if you'd like to do that. How thankful are you for the ones who sit next to you? How thankful are you for the ones that are across from you? If you attend a church, how thankful are you for the ones who is in the pew in front of you or the seats behind you? The Bible says they'll know you are Christians by your love. Now that's something I'll be coming back to maybe next Sunday as I continue on the last part of this chapter. But how true of a statement is that? They will know you are Christians by your love. For just a moment, think about the last time you told someone you were thankful for them, for their friendship, for their kindness, even for their time they give you. When was the last time you mentioned someone's name in prayer that you were thankful for? Just to say, Lord, thank you for John, or for Sue, or for Mary, or for George. When was the last time? Just because you wanted to be thankful. There's an expression, and I think we've all understood this, or maybe experienced this maybe at one time or another. The expression is called puppy love. Of course, everyone knows and loves a puppy. I like puppies. Uh, I usually like them when they're puppies, but when they become bigger dogs, it's more of a challenge, but um, I love the puppy. They have that endless energy, that affection. They just want to play. This expression, puppy love, began in the 1800s, and it usually, today at least for us, it references young love, first love. But the original concept was more like a friendship that was based on loyalty. A friendship based on loyalty. Love without judgment. A friendship that's non-judgmental. Interesting, isn't it? 
As a Christian, I have very strong convictions. I do. I have this word, and I believe it. I believe this, this word of God. And this word does give me strong convictions. And, and for me, I will honor this word. I will follow it to the best of my ability. I'm going to pray that in my weakness, God help me through the Holy Spirit to do what the Bible tells me to do. And so I do have these strong convictions as a believer. Strong convictions. However, that being said, I'm not the judge of other men's hearts. That's a place only God can do. That's only what God can do. He judges all men. For me, I live Christ and I teach truth, which is our, mental, uh, our statement here at First Assembly. Live love, teach truth. This is what makes the body of Christ strong. When I truly become thankful for those around me. Every one of us brings uniqueness to the body of Christ. We all do. We're precious to Him. Each one precious in the sight of Christ. We need to be valued by each other. We need to value those around us. And so Paul talks about this, this value of prayer. I want to understand that. I want to recognize that value. Paul also has a focus in his prayer. He's not just praying aimlessly, not just giving a lot of words because they sound good. No, Paul has a focus to his prayer. He's thankful for the person. Now, most of us are thankful when things go our way. I know that's true for me. When I've had a really good day, I'm quick to thank God for the goodness of his life. But when I have a difficult day, I'm not quite so quick to thank God for being with me, walking with me in that difficult day. However, for Paul, he learned how to be content in whatever place he found himself, good or bad, high or low, sunny or rainy. Paul found himself consistently giving thanks to God. His, his focus of prayer was always consistent. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In, every, in, ev in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret to being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering in need. That's what Paul is saying in Philippians to his letter there to the church at Philippi. I understand what it's like to get along with humble means. I've been in some, over the years, very fancy homes. Homes that had an abundance of blessing, great food on the table, and yet no peace in the house. Kids that weren't content with moms and dads, and mom and dads that were frustrated with the kids. I've also been in very meager homes. Sometimes overseas where the oven is the fireplace in the center of a small home of four rooms that are divided by walls that cross and in the center wall is the firebox that heats the four rooms, the chambers. That also is what they cook on. And their water comes from a well outside that they pump to bring water into the house. They don't have running bathroom water or shower water, they have an outhouse, but very meager. And I've sat around their table as we've eaten together, the provisions that they put onto the table. And I've watched the kids laugh and smile, have fun, mom and dad, comfortable and content. Even though when you look on the natural things, they have very little. And I discover contentment never comes from what I have, but rather what's in my heart. Paul says, I've learned to become content in little or a lot. It doesn't matter. My contentment's not based on material things. It's something deeper. Difficulties produce character, I believe. I believe when I face a difficulty, 
whether I'm successful in navigating it or not. I think those difficulties help develop in me character. When we raise our kids, I want them to learn how to solve problems and figure things out. Otherwise, they're always going to be dependent. If every time they stub their toe or scratch their finger, I come to the run to meet with them and help them and banish them and cuddle them. Every time, eventually, I'm going to be tying their shoes until their own person because I've never let them tie their own shoe. I can just imagine when they're at the altar, our son at the altar getting ready to get married. And just before he says his vows to his future beautiful bride, we the parent notice his shoes untied. And we run up to the altar, we stop the ceremony. We say, son, just a moment, before you give your vows, let me tie your shoe. Huh. Difficulties create character. It was during the hardships that Paul really showed his true heart for others. When we see his heart as he prays for God's blessing on believers and gives thanks for them, even though he himself is maybe sitting in prison and struggling. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Be thankful. That's part of our Christian life. We are thankful people in good and difficult seasons of life. We are thankful for the love of God, the provision He gives and for the fellowship of other believers. Remember last week we talked about Paul's blueprint for a healthy church. Love God. Love people. Let's move on. Ephesians 1, 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. As Paul writes, he once again connects Old Testament covenant to New Testament reality. Two contracts, the old and the new. And he's praying that they will have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Logically. Maybe Christianity doesn't make a lot of sense. Logically. But then there becomes the spirit of revelation. When God touches my heart through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, and I find myself in need of God, I'm in need of forgiveness, I'm in need of salvation, and I ask Christ to come into my heart, the spirit of revelation and knowledge in Him. The Old Testament gave hope for the future that was coming. In future terms, they were looking for the light that would come into the world. and The world was covered in darkness, and, and they're op waiting for the opening of the eyes of the blind. Isaiah 42, verse 6 and 7. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will also uphold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will point you as a covenant to the people as a light to the nation, speaking of Christ, to open blind eyes and bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. This light was the promise. It was coming. And the Old Testament covenant followers lived with this someday promise, this someday hope. Someday God will deliver. Someday a Redeemer will come. Someday. The Ephesian believers knew that Old Testament, and they knew the promises of the coming light of God. They came under John the Baptist's teaching, which had been that old covenant teaching. But here comes Paul, and he comes along and states, the light that was the someday is Jesus now. The someday has become today. This was the need. These Believers that, believers that Ephesus needed to have their eyes opened. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. When Christ came, 
He was described in the scripture as the dawning of a new day. He was bringing in the light of God. And even John referenced that in John chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light. John the Baptist came to testify about the light someday so that all who might believe through him. Now John was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was a true light which was coming to the world, enlightening every man. This is what Paul told the believers in Corinth as well, in his second letter to them. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who said, Light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Without Christ, or the knowledge of Christ, the eyes of people are blind and they're in darkness. It's exactly what was described by Paul in the letter to the church at Rome. Romans 1.21 For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. I know people today, they believe there is a God. They believe in Christ. They believe Christ rose from the grave. But they don't believe in Christ. They don't follow after God. Their eyes have been darkened. They haven't seen the Christ. So for everyone who believes in Christ and has accepted Him, that He came to die for our sins and redeem us, and we accept that, our eyes are enlightened, and we're made to see who He is. Now, there are different ways to understand the eyes of the heart. It's not just a place where our emotions rest, but really it's the center of that inner man the Bible speaks about. And Paul begins this letter in Ephesus, this part of this prayer, by referencing this gift given by God, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17, and that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I like the word gift there, may give you this gift. Now when my kids, Valerie and Alex, were young, not only did I enjoy giving them a present or a gift, it was also fun to sit down with them and show them how to use the gift, especially if there's any sort of construction involved. This last Christmas, one of the things that we had purchased was a gift for our grandson that was a Hot Wheels track. And it was so fun sitting down with Alex and Marcus on the living room carpet and putting this Hot Wheels track all together and, and connecting the various things to it that would propel the cars down the track and go through loops that they would navigate. And it's so fun. By the time we got done, that track covered the living room. It was everywhere. It was all over the place. Cars flying in the air. It was fun to watch. Here Paul's telling us about this gift of God. In a way, he's explaining to us how to use it or take advantage of it. He's given us the instructions. And a gift, the great thing about a gift is that it's just that. It's a gift. It should not have strings attached to it. As long as it's used for what it's intended, it should be good to go. And here we're given wisdom and the revelation of God. This week I had a Bible study that I do on Zoom each Tuesday. And it's from the book of Proverbs. And it's where a man is really given a choice between foolishness and wisdom. And I know a lot of the book of Proverbs deals with wisdom and foolishness both. God offers us wisdom. It comes from this word. 
I mean, James talks about it, and Proverbs a lot talks about wisdom. If I really want God's wisdom, I need God's Word. Of course, uh, without that, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to be using human wisdom, which has limitations. I know my w wisdom is very limited, but the wisdom of God is incredible. And God offers wisdom, but I have to choose to accept that wisdom. It is a gift of God. And too many, too many people it seems walk away, walks away from wisdom, and they kind of uh, enjoy maybe foolishness. Let me just say, there are times when wisdom is a precious commodity in our life. Precious commodity. It's like gold. I, I remember as a child stopping in Colorado on our way through. And they had one of these rivers where you could pan for gold. Of course, as a young, young child, I thought, wow, I'm going to become rich. I'm going to, uh, we're going to stop and we're going to pan for gold. And my, my parents stopped so we could all enjoy panning for gold in the ice-cold mountain river. And, and they paid the, the ticket price for a pan and, and they showed us how to, how to use it and, and uh, swish the water around to blow out the, the uh, uh, lighter material and then the, the flakes of gold, quote unquote, would settle more towards the bottom, and I'm expecting to find these chunks of gold in my pan, and I scoop in a big pile of debris, and I mean, think about it. They have you in this one section. This has probably been used by 15,000 people, all swishing the exact same ground over a period of years. The likelihood of finding anything, even trace amounts of gold, would be minimum, but being young, I didn't realize any of that, and with a childlike faith, I would dip my big uh, pan into the river, get a pile of dirt, and swish it around, waiting to find that gold nugget. And of course, you know the story. I didn't find any. Wisdom is very much like searching for that fine treasure of gold. It takes a lot of work. It takes time and patience, perseverance, to really find wisdom. And it usually comes in small amounts. I don't just have a boatload of wisdom sitting in a shelf in my closet. That's why Paul said God gives us the spirit of wisdom. If I ask God, He will give me a spirit of wisdom. So what do I take away from these verses in Ephesians chapter 1, 16, verse 16 and 17? Well, one, I understand there's a value of prayer and that there's a focus of prayer. Paul has referenced both of them. He talked about the friends, the friendship, the, the person that sits beside us in church. And he talks about this gift of wisdom and revelation in Christ to help me know who Jesus really is. Let me pray with you that these become part of who we are. Jesus, help us today. Help us in our understanding, having this value of prayer. Have a, a focus of prayer. Enjoying those who sit close to me, that friendship and the value of that friendship. And that you have given me a gift, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, Lord, I need that. Help me see Christ and Him glorified. Help me see Jesus and live as your child. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust this has helped you today. Anytime you want to contact us, we're glad to pray with you. If you like this, please hit your share button. Expand that footprint a little bit, and maybe someone else that you know will be blessed. God be with you. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Hey, church family. Thank you so much for tuning in to our first at-home online service. If you would like prayer today, we would love to pray for you. You can contact us in any way in Facebook or over email, or you can call us at our church office Phone. And also, if you'd like to give to our church today, you can follow our website at firstassemblyww.com slash giving, or you can text AOG1 to 555-888 and also get that same exact link. 
But we hope that this message blessed you today and that you heard God's word specifically to your life today. And we hope to see you next week at church indoors, but if not, we will catch you online.